Thank you so much. First of all, here's my card uh, with my address and email on it. Feel free to send me spam. Um, my name's Mark Davis. I'm an attorney, semi-retired, uh, specializing in music and entertainment law. The bio is a little bit old. I've been practicing law for 30 years now, which puts me much older than any one of my students I've ever uh, taught here at Loyola. And I've been here since 2001 teaching copyright and legal issues in the music industry. All of the students from here have had me. Just to ask them, they'll tell you how great I am. So that's my bio. Uh, in everybody's packet, there should be four pages or five pages. It's, the first one starts with songwriter. Um, then it'll be music publisher. Yep, got it. All right. Songwriter, music publisher, recording artist, and record label. I'm going to start off by explaining how the music business is set up. Well, if you don't, it's in the first perk app. First, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm not responsible for anything else in the packet, just this. I'm going to approach copyright from the music industry point of view. But I want to be clear that what copyright covers is applicable to anything that is copyrightable. In the music business, it's broken down into four roles. The first one is the songwriter. The second one is the music publisher. Third one is artist. Last, record label. Now in the business, we refer to the sides of the music business. This side, the relationship between the songwriter and the music publisher, is called the publishing side. Over here, the record label and the recording artist, that's called the label side. But let's get back to the essence of all of this. The essence of all of this is the copyright. What is a copyright? Why do we have a copyright? Why do we care? And most importantly, how do we make money from our copyright? First of all, everybody's creating copyrights right now if you're taking notes. If you're not, you're not creating anything. Anything that is an original expression in fixed form is copyrightable, which can be your notes. It can be the music that you've composed. It's the videotape that they're shooting. It's a painting, a drawing, a building. Anything that is a fixed expression that's original is copyrightable. What does the songwriter do? He creates something that's copyrightable. And I'm going to give it the symbol, the C in the circle symbol. Which, of course, you all have seen a million zillion times. Under US law, the copyright begins at the moment of fixation. Once the ink is dry on your drawing, you have the copyright. You don't have to go through the process of registration. You want to do that for legal reasons later and if you have to sue. But you have your copyright beginning at the moment of fixation. How long does that last? Well, a really long time. We have the life plus 70 years. Now, I don't plan to die anytime soon, but anything that I've created after January 1st, 78, that's when the copyright law changed in the US, the copyright holds for my life and for my children, 
for my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, 70 years after I pass away. That is an entirely different way of looking at things because a good hit song will put money in your pocket, put your kids through college, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. It's going to keep generating money all the way down the line. And that's what I try to tell the students, that copyright is very much a long-term game. It's, uh, I listen to uh, uh, satellite radio. I listen to a lot of Frank Sinatra songs. Uh, and uh, uh, Jimmy Van Eusen, I'm in a Jimmy Van Eusen mood uh, lately. So I'm like, when did he write that song? Maybe 1964? I'm listening to it now. So a good hit song lasts forever. How many people know Pachelbel's Canon? Yeah. <laughs> hit song lasts forever. A lot of people are covering it lately too, even though they, don't, they won't tell you that they are. So life plus 70 years. The relationship between the publisher and the songwriter is how we exploit the rights given to the songwriter or whoever creates the copyright. It could be an author, it could be the painter, it could be the photographer, the videographer. Section 106 rights are what are conveyed. And there's a list on your handout of the Section 106 rights. I'll go through them briefly, but these rights start off when the copyright is original expression in fixed form. You have the right to reproduce the work. That makes sense. What good is having a copy right if you don't have the right to copy? That's 106 number one. If we go to 106 number three, distribution and sale of those copies. What good is it if you have the right to make a copy if you can't sell them or at least offer them for sale because there's no guarantee anybody will buy anything. Number two, section 106, number two, is the right to make a derivative. And when you first think about it, you go, well, derivative, uh, I don't know. How does that work? Well, think about it this way. Think about James Bond. Ian Fleming books, all the movies are derivatives of the books. The permission of the copyright holder, Ian Fleming and his publisher, needed to be retained in order to make those movies. I don't know how many billions of dollars the James Bond movies have made, and they're making another cycle of them again with, what, the fifth James Bond? That's going to crank out money for as long as people want to see 007. Think also about Star Trek. How many TV shows, how many movies, how many spin-off TV shows? These are all the derivative rights that are inherent in section 106, number two. Now, section number six, 104 and 105, uh, section 106, part four, part five, the right to public performance, right to public display. These are sort of twin rights. You can perform music. You can't really perform sculpture. You can display sculpture. So section four and section five are twin rights, public performance, public display. Section 106 only applies to sound recordings. Now, I wrote the C in the circle. That's what we're used to seeing. If you go home and look at your um, CDs, on the back cover, it may have something like the letter P in the circle. P in the circle indicates that it is a sound recording. Just like I said, once something is fixed, it is copyrightable. Once a sound recording is fixed, it's copyrightable. You may have to have your uh, cassette player to listen to it or your computer because it's an MP3, but that's sound recording. Section 106, number six, is rights that are specific to sound recordings in addition to the rest of the 106 rights. Okay, so the law says in order to encourage um, 
authors and inventors, this is from the Constitution, and it's really there because I've seen the Constitution, it's in Washington. Um, we're going to encourage authors and inventors by granting exclusive rights for limited times. The Section 106 rights are the exclusive rights. The copyright holder owns those rights. Limited times, life plus 70 years. Now, if it's a corporation, you calculate it a different way. It's 95 years from publication or 120 from creation, whichever is shorter. That's on your notes, too. I hope you're writing notes because it's going to be on the final exam. And the final exam is how to make money from the music business. So we have our exclusive rights. How do we make money from them? That's where the music publisher comes in. And, oh, in order to do money, I have a green marker. So the publisher is looking for the money. Oh, OK, that's good. The usual deal between the songwriter and the publisher is that the songwriter assigns the copyright to the publisher. Maybe 100%, maybe half percent, it, uh, half of it. It depends on the publishing deal. The publisher exploits the 106 rights. And in music and in law, exploit is not a bad word. It's how we make these intangible rights into cash. So the publisher collects the money from the use of the 106 rights and sends part of it back to the songwriter. That is the music publishing deal in, what, four icons. Of course, it gets more complex than that, and that's why we have lawyers to handle things. So we have the exploitation of the Section 106 rights. Now, how do we do that? If you look at the uh, page on the music publisher, it goes into a little bit more detail on what music publishers do. They hold the PA. Now, when I say PA, that means that you would register your claim to this copyright on form PA in the Copyright Office. You have it already, but when you register it in Washington, you get extra benefits. PA stands for Performing Arts. And since we're talking about music today, compositions would be on form PA. If you're filing the copyright registration for a sound recording, that would be on form SR, and the record label would hold the P in the circle copyright on the composition. CDs are covered with copyrightable things. You've got the sound recording that's copyrightable. You've got a dozen compositions with songwriters and music publishers, all of which are copyrightable. You've got photographs. There's copyright there. You've got uh, liner notes, copyright there. There's graphic designs, all kinds of things. It's just a treasure trove for uh, copyright attorneys. Anyway, Section 106, 1 and 3 says to make copies and to distribute and sell those copies. The reason we call it music publishing is because that used to be the only way copies of compositions got to the public. They were actual publishers who had to engrave printing plates sell the sheet music, and that's how they did it. Composers didn't make much money from that. Mozart had private uh, patrons. He had to put on concerts. So did Franz Liszt. He was the rock and roll star of the 1800s. But he put, ah, you like Franz Liszt, ah, yeah. Um, he, put, he was a rock star. He put on concerts. That's how they made their money. Since 100 years ago, when uh, Edison came up with sound recording, you've got um, another way of putting copies of those compositions out into the public, not just sheet music. You have a copy of that composition on Edison's wax cylinder, on your CD, on a cassette tape, on an MP3. Here's... Uh, um, another source of income for the publisher. 
the record label has to pay money to the publisher for each copy of the composition pressed and distributed. If you look on the sheet, that's called Section 115. That's a mechanical license where we're making a mechanical copy of the composition. Think of pressing a vinyl record. You've got grooves in the master that's being pressed into the plastic. That is a copy. Section 115 money goes to the publisher. But that's not the only source of income. That's a very large source of income, but not the only. You've got other uses of the composition. You've got public performances. Remember Section 106, number 4 and 5, public performance, public display. There are performing rights organizations that collect money for songwriters and publishers from public performances. ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Any members of ASCAP, C ASCAP BMI? ASCAP. ASCAP. Rudolf Frimmel was one of the founders of it. And uh, how many people know who Rudolf Frimmel? <laughs> very good, very good. Um, the problem in New York in the 1920s, there was really, and in the 19 teens, there was no way for composers to collect money from public performances of their work. If, if a show was playing on Broadway, that was fine. They could walk down the street and go, oh yeah, it's my show on Broadway, where's my cut of the box office? But music being performed in cafes or nightclubs or on that newfangled thing that came out in the 20s, radio, there was no way for them to collect. So four or five of composers at that time, Irving Berlin was one of them, uh, Rudolf Frimmel, there's uh, three or four other ones. They got together and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pool our performing rights. And we're going to have one organization, ASCAP, American Society of Composers, Authors, Publishers, go out and collectively license our work to radio stations and cafes and nightclubs, concert halls, and that's how the public performance money goes back to the publishers and to the songwriters. To make a very long story short, a portion of all income for radio, TV, nightclub performances goes to ASCAP, goes to another society, BMI, Broadcast Music Inc., uh, goes to third U.S. society, CSAC. Um, they collect the money and distribute to their publishers and member songwriters. But wait, that's not all. There's more money to be made over here. We've got the Section 115 mechanical licenses that are going to crank out 9.1 cents per copy. We've got public performances. We've also got uses of these compositions in other ways. We can use this composition not only on a record, we could put it in a movie. That's called a synchronization license, a sync, S-Y-N, sync. That allows the use of the composition in timed relation to some visual image on the screen. Another source of income. There's advertising. There's parody. There's little gift cards that when you open it up, they play little songs. Who's seen that? Cards, uh, novelties. Teddy bears, you press the button, it sings a song. Ringtones on your cell phone. That's money for songwriters and publishers. There's a tremendous source of income there. Now I'm briefly going to jump over to the other side of the business, the record label side. Just like we have a relationship between the songwriter and publisher about the exploitation, it's a good word, of Section 106 rights, we have another relationship between the recording artist and the record label about the exploitation of the 106 rights also. And if you look, there's a sheet on recording artist and on record label. What the recording artist does essentially is sell his recorded performance to the label 
for a percentage of the sales. That's a 300-page recording contract in one sentence. Remember, this is the recorded performance. Live performances, the record label doesn't participate in that. Uh, if the recording artist is in a movie, the record label doesn't participate in that. The record label only makes money three ways. And this is why record labels are kind of dying and changing. The three ways they make money, they sell actual copies of sound recordings. They sell the CDs, they sell the tapes, physical copies. Second way, they license the use of the sound recording. How many people have seen KTEL hits of the 60s? Well, KTEL isn't really a record label. They haven't recorded all those artists. They've gone to other record labels and other holders of the sound recordings and licensed those compilations together. The same way if a recorded performance is in a movie, that requires a license be issued by the record label to the movie producer for the recorded performance. Now that's a little bit different from the license from the publisher to the movie producer for the composition itself. That's why in movies a lot of times the composition will be played by a band that's different from the original band that made it famous. The third way that a record label makes money and Remember I said before, section 106, number six, is only applicable to sound recordings. The third way they make money is from digital audio transmission. How many people have uh, XM or Sirius satellite radio? That's a digital audio transmission. How many people have downloaded streaming internet media? That's also digital transmission. So there's a little bit of money there for the record labels. I'll give you a great hint about what's going to be happening in the next two or three years. You know all television is going to go digital by February of 2009. And you've got to get a converter box from Radio Shack and all of that. The next step in the process is that all terrestrial radio will go digital in a few years after that, which means that all radio performances, not just the satellite performances, but radio performances will be digital transmissions. So that's another source of income for record labels or the holders of the P in the circle sound recording copyright. Now there's a million questions. Yeah, you got a question? Yes, yeah, so how does that differ? So it's going to be more money because the call is going to be digital? Yes, it'll be more money. The uh, radio stations will have to pay into a fund, and that fund will pay just, it'll be parallel to BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC, who pay the songwriters and the publishers. The fund will be parallel to that, and they'll pay the record labels. And usually, in the recording contract between the recording artist and the record label, there's a clause that says, how they will allocate uh, other sources of income, like the digital audio transmissions or licensing of the sound recordings to a movie or, or other uses. So why do they, make, why do they differ between the analog and the digital transmissions? Why do they um, I don't know. <laughs> it was, uh, um, really, the law came in in the late 70s, and back then, that was before they invented this inter internet thing. And I, I understand this, it's going to catch on with the kids, this internet thing. So um, that was really before they even had that in their brain. For them, digital audio transmission was the cable that uh, people in certain communities in the mountains couldn't get broadcast TV because the mountains were blocking the antennas. All they could get was cable TV. But now, cable TV has gone digital, and not only can you get 100 channels of movies, you can get 100 channels of music. That, too, is digital audio transmission. So part of your cable bill 
for channel 259 to channel 3000 music, that'll go digital audio transmission, and also some of that money, since it's broadcast, will go to the publishers and songwriters. Okay, that's copyright. Everybody's now an expert on copyright. Let's talk a little bit more about teaching in the classroom and how that's applicable there. I'll start off by saying copyright is a balance. It's a balance of two opposed principles. We like the idea of free transmission of ideas. It's good. It's how a civilization grows and adapts and extends itself. That's what Western civilization is all about. Think of Western civilization without the printing press. You really can't do it. The printing press was a huge problem for the concept of copyright. Before then, if you wanted a copy of your manuscript, you hired a monk to write it out by hand. And that's what they did. They wrote it out by hand. That was it. it you controlled the copy as an author. All of a sudden, Gutenberg can print, hey, you want a Bible? I'll print out 20 copies of it. You got a book you want to write on agriculture? Sure, I'll keep printing it out. So we have the free transmission of ideas, and then on the other hand, we have the problem of how does that author really get compensated for the effort that they've put into it? So this is always a balance. We like the free transmission, but we want to have a monopoly to encourage authors to put out their effort and get money for it. It's always a balancing act. Where it comes down to us today in the, in the Constitution, the Constitution grants limited rights, exclusive rights rather, for limited time periods. Always a balancing act. You can't have the monopoly forever. We don't have to chase down the great, 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 great grandchildren of Shakespeare to put a play on. Those rights end at a certain point. At that point, it's public domain and anybody can use it. The TEACH Act tries to explain what fair use is. Now, everybody thinks they know what fair use is, and they, they really don't because um, what I've been doing a lot of is giving lectures to educators about fair use and copyright in the classroom. And they think automatically, oh, it's fair use because I'm an educator. That isn't really the case. Remember, we've got a balancing act with the Section 106 exclusive rights. Section 107 is the other half of the balance. Section 107 says, there are exceptions to the 106 rights. And one of the exceptions is fair use. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Fair use is not a right. Fair use is an excuse once you've been sued for copyright infringement. <laughs> so the, the you get served and you've been sued for copyright infringement. By the way, you could be on the hook for up to $150,000 or maybe even more. So you've been sued. Your defense is fair use. And if you look at the last page here, these are some of the issues that we look at to determine whether or not something is fair use. It's never a bright and easy, clear distinction that's made in law. But the four things that the judge looks for, what is the purpose of the use of this work? Is it an educational purpose? Is it profit or nonprofit? Is it some sort of review or criticism or comment? What is the, the context that you're quote unquote, infringing. What are you doing that gives you an excuse to put another bit of weight and evidence on the side of the scale that says, yes, we're allowing the free transmission of ideas? The second is, what's the nature of the original work? Was it published or unpublished? Is it fiction or nonfiction? 
unpublished fictional works have a higher degree of protection. Nonfiction works have a lower degree. For example, you cannot get a copyright on a fact. 1492, Columbus discovered the New World. OK, that's a fact. I could write a book about it. Somebody could write a play about it. Somebody else could paint that picture. Neither one of us is infringing any of the others because it's a fact. We're expressing in an original way that fact in our fixed form. Uh, but the fact itself is not copyrightable. The third factor that uh, courts look for is how much was taken. Are you taking a little bit or a whole lot? And what are you taking? Uh, giving a lecture one time to a group of uh, um, educators, music educators, one of the uh, guys was saying, well, you know, I'd like to assign my students sections from an opera. And what can I do? Can I put it on reserve? Do I make copies? And, and this, is, this is like a four-hour seminar that we, that we give. But the short answer is, what do you do in the classroom? You can't play the entire opera in the classroom. You can play highlights and fast forward. You can say, OK, I want you to listen to this aria and then compare it to the other aria. But we're not going to watch the whole performance in one classroom. And besides, there's some sort of control over the classroom. It's not open to the public. It's a face-to-face -face teaching situation. And that's another important thing to think about for fair use. The last factor that gets analyzed is a question of what is the effect on the value of the original work? Are you just a substitute for the original? Or are you not affecting? Gee, if I write this song, is everyone going to buy my song and nobody's going to buy the first one? Or if I copy an entire book, and at the beginning of it I say, and this is for review and comment and criticism, and then verbatim put the entire book <laughs> in it and sell it for a dime, well, people aren't going to buy the original. It affects the value. Obviously, that's an absurd example. But you see, there is no bright line. A lot of students ask me all the time, well, you know, what about uh, infringement and can't you do four bars? And I was like, no, it's never a bright line. And uh, the example I give is, OK, name this tune. Da -da. What is it? T two notes. <laughs> so it, you can't say, well, you know, you can take, you can't take three notes, you can't take two notes, you can't. No, it's the essence. What are you taking? Now, in that situation, you'd go, the amount taken is so little. It's only two notes. And the whole composition, it goes for bars and bars and bars and bars. Well, all the sharks eat everybody. But you go, that's the essence. That's the hook. That's the important part when someone who's you know, singing very flat can even say, da -da -da, and people go, oh, yeah, yeah, Jaws, the sharks are coming. You've taken the essence of that. So in short, the TEACH Act tries to help educators in what they can and can't do with copyright in the classroom. And more importantly now, there's even more rules that are applicable for putting courses online. There's on and on and on. Section 110 of the copyright law is the TEACH Act. Section 108 is another section talking about libraries and archives. And it's a very complex subject. That's why I, I gave you my uh, um, email at the bottom. We have a, uh, a website called buzzgig.com. I have a blog on it on copyright issues and frequently asked questions. And uh, um, so anyone want to frequently ask a question right now? Sure. No, I don't. So I would like to ask this question because it's very relevant to music educators. 
uh, unless the money that comes from the state government is going to be different than the money that comes from every other state government. There's not going to be a tremendous amount of money for music. Um, in New York State, we have something um, called NISTL funds, New York State textbook money. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they have that in Louisiana, but in, with that, principals get a certain allocation of textbook money and since music is the textbook in a music class, and not all music teachers know that, yes. they're, they're allowed to get a share of that pot to buy music. But we all know that we're all guilty of making copies because we just don't have money to purchase music. And so that's the first part of my question, because I know it's done and it's Every time somebody does it, we all say, you know, you're not supposed to do that, but we don't have money to, to buy it. And on the other hand, and the other side of my question is, how is all this stuff monitored? So okay. you can answer the first question first okay. and then. Well, uh, it's, you're absolutely right about the first question and making copies. I'm, I'm coming more from a university background. Obviously, we have a College of Music and Fine Arts here. They have a license with ASCAP and BMI and CSAC for public performances. Also, um, there is a, a leniency on face-to-face -face performances in classrooms. So a music teacher and their students, or I'm playing a bit of a CD to illustrate a point. The, down the line, it gets more complex when you're buying charts for the marching band or the wind ensemble or things like that. Um, then the best deal is to contact the publisher. They do have educational divisions. Um, and the same thing, uh, that issue comes up a lot in religious services and devotional things. Uh, although there are music publishers in the devotional field and they want their money because there's a composer who wrote the composition and should be for that. Now, I don't know how to answer that question with state funds and how to allocate that. But the second question about monitoring, one of the things the publisher does is to monitor all the deals that are going out there. Every quarter, for example, uh, the songwriter and the music publisher get a printout of surveys of public performances on the radio. That is a statistical estimation at best because there's something like 13,000 radio stations in the United States. And think of how many, music, uh, how many musical selections they can play per hour for 24 hours a day times 13,000. It's hard to aggregate all of that together. But the public performance societies, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, do that and they allocate. Every country in the world has something similar for public performances. In uh, England, it's PRS, Public uh, Performing Rights Society. In Japan, it's JazzRack. In Germany, it's GEMA, G-E-M-A. There's BUMA in Holland. All of these um, performance rights societies would collect for performances on Dutch radio or French radio. And if it's a US composer and publisher, there's a reciprocal agreement that Dutch money Dutch performance money goes to New York, ASCAP, BMI, gets spread around. Same thing. ABBA plays on the radio here. ASCAP, BMI collects. They send it to Sweden. Um, the publishers are also the ones that do the deals with the, um, with the movie studios. And I'll, I'll tell you a really brief story. I was licensing a sync license of a New Orleans tune for a movie. So they uh, called up my client, who was a member of BMI, because you list your name and phone number, and that's how they find you. So he called me up. He said, these guys want to license a movie. And um, so they called me up, and I said, oh, OK, well, tell me, tell me what it's about, because this song had not earned a penny since 1966. <laughs> how they found it, I don't know. Um, so he called me up and he said, yeah, you know, we, we want to do this. We want to put it in a movie. Uh, like, okay. And I'm thinking, hey, 
any deal has to be a good deal. It hasn't earned a cent in, in you know, almost 40 years. So uh, I said, yeah, OK, tell me more about the movie. They go, well, you know, it's uh, this uh, director, uh, Robert Rodriguez. He's only made one movie before called El Mariachi. And we've got this new Spanish actor. We think we're, you know, he's going to be a hit and all. And so I said, all right, who's on, who's on the soundtrack? Who are the other people on the soundtrack? And they said, well, Los Lobos and Link Ray and all the people. And I said, OK, we'll do the deal. Fine. So the movie comes out. The movie's Desperado, right? <laughs> and, and it's a real big hit. So I go to see it in the theater, listening for the music. It's not there. And I call them up. I said, the check's good. The, you know, they sent me the money. The paperwork's fine. The, the check's good. We've already cashed the check and spent it. Um, thanks for paying. Where did you use it in the movie? Because I, I rented it on, on tape. This is how long ago it was. Um, rented it on tape, play through. Couldn't hear it. Couldn't hear it. And they said, oh, it's in the barroom scene. It's playing on the jukebox in the barroom when Quentin Tarantino is telling the joke and then everybody shoots each other with machine guns. So you can't hear the song because everybody's shooting each other with machine guns. But still, they paid. And that is the essence of what a publisher does. He is using everything that he can to get money for the composition for his songwriter and ultimately for himself, too. So any other questions? And no, I've never met Antonio Banderas, but. <laughs> yes, another question. Yes, obviously, like, you know, in classrooms, like, when a member provides a composition, it seems like, I'm, I guess, about a hobby, too, um, that frequently there's not enough parts for every you know, musician. And I'm wondering, so when you, when you buy that piece that you copy for other people in the group, I mean, what are you buying exactly? It, that's that's a, a real good question, and it's a very touchy subject. You, should you be buying a full score for every member, and then they're just reading their piece and all? There's no easy answers to that. Sometimes music publishers understand that. Sometimes they don't. The music publishers that have a big repertoire that's, that's focused on education, they understand that. And this isn't legal advice. Because although I am a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer. Uh, <laughs> it's how blatant are you? It's one thing if you go, all right, you're first violin, I'm second violin. We, it, we have one sheet of music, let's photocopy it while we practice together. You know, that's one thing. Another one is, oh, I'll just make a copy of the entire composition or the entire sound recording for all of the 150 members of the marching band. That's fine. I'll just turn the, the photocopy on and keep cranking it out. That's the other end of the spectrum. And it's a difficult question. I wish I could give you an easy answer, and I can't. Uh, but that's something that needs to be determined. Mm -hmm. well, I was just going to say, just a comment, um, that recently I was doing a project with a publisher, uh, and this issue came up. There were like weird excerpts that were being done by a choral group. Yeah. And um, the, and actually, it was easier for the publisher to say, you know what? Pay us a project fee. Pay us a fee. You make the copies mm -hmm. because it's like this page, that page. You know, it's like they didn't yeah. want to get into it. They didn't want to have to do that. We'll sell you, you know, ten copies of the full score. You make. You make the copies, pay us a fee that we've agreed upon, which it wasn't so much money, mm -hmm. but but it was the right to make copies. Yes. So publishers are even willing to do that oh, they are. If, if you'll talk to them about it. It depends on the kind of the you know absolutely. The idiosyncrasies, you know, idiosyncrasies of the project. Part. You're, you're absolutely right. And publishers would prefer to get a dollar as opposed to zero. The other question, I don't know if you know the answer to it. What happened to the copies when the project were over? Did they have to mail them back to the publisher? In this case, no. But that, that very much yeah, is the case. Yeah, you're, you're putting on the, the, the opera at the end or whatever. You have, a rental, right? yeah, you have to send it all back. But that, that's a good thing. And I don't know, maybe the state would be able to make 
big deals with music publishers and say, look, we've got I don't know how many students at once in 64 parishes that are going through this curriculum that we've determined to follow, so we're going to need lots of copies. That's, you know, and it's, it's good for the publishers also, because that's another source of income for their composers. Any other questions? If you do, uh, have any, send me an email. My email's on there at buzzgig.com. Read the blog. Comment on the blog. Um, if you say dirty words, I can pull it off, though. But uh, there's a lot of copyright information there, especially for composers and musicians. And uh, I'm adding more on for music educators. And uh, anything you want to know about copyright, just ask me a question, and I, I might give you the right answer. Thank you very much.